Our scripture text this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. Listen for a word from God. They came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Holy God, thank you for your word to us. I pray that you would open our ears and our eyes and our minds to the message you have for us today. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Church archives are fascinating. I was once teaching confirmation at a church on the East Coast, and one of our tasks was to go through the archives of this old, old Presbyterian church. So it was part research, I think part chore, they were having us organize, but we got to see some pretty incredible things in these archive files. And one of the most interesting things that the students loved was this list of rules that we found from what appeared to be the Sunday school classes of the 1950s. And so there were some rules on there that you might expect, some pretty common things that we might hear today, and then there were some sort of dated rules as well. So here were the ones that I could remember. Respect your teacher. Respect your elders. Always be on time. Dress your best before God. Girls and women are to wear skirts or dresses with pantyhose. Do not ever raise your voice. Be nice to others. Never argue. Maintain a positive attitude. Always smile. And the one that I remember the most that the students in confirmation just loved, never go to the movies on a Sunday. Apparently, this was a Sunday school rule. Don't go to the movies on Sunday. It is God's day. Christianity has a long and complicated history with the notion of good behavior. Now, don't get me wrong. Some of these rules are common sense, and absolutely, we want to highlight kindness, and we want to encourage respect. But sometimes I think politeness and Christianity have gotten conflated. Niceness and holiness have gotten confused. And even today, long since the 1950s, we hear explicitly and implicitly messages all the time. As Christians, you need to be nice. Don't disrupt Maintain the status quo. Be happy and smile all the time. Always be kind and don't raise your voice. It's why I love this story that we come to in Mark's gospel today so much. Because we see a man, Bartimaeus, breaking all kinds of rules. Bartimaeus is a man who is blind and has been begging near the city of Jericho. 
And when he hears that this Jesus of Nazareth is in town, he shouts, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then very quickly, the scripture tells us that those around the followers and the crowds try to shush him. They say, man, shh, be polite. This is an important teacher here. Do not raise your voice. So what does Bartimaeus do? He shouts even louder. Son of David, have mercy on me. He's creating a scene. And you can almost feel the embarrassment of the crowds around him as they fear the response of Jesus. Bartimaeus has nothing to lose in this moment. We've talked several times before about what it meant to live with some kind of physical or mental limitation in this time of Jesus. It meant that you were outside of the community. You weren't allowed to work. You wouldn't have the same opportunities to make a living. You wouldn't have the same opportunities to worship in community, to gather with others. You would be socially outside of the loop. And so here he is trying to survive through begging, and he knows something of this teacher, this Jesus of Nazareth. And in fact, even though he can't see with his eyes, he sees and understands a truth that so many others around have missed. He calls Jesus, this teacher, the son of David. The son of David, King David, Bartimaeus is making this connection to the messianic prophecies. He's essentially confessing out loud that this teacher is the one who has come to save. And this is the very first time in Mark's gospel that that's used to describe Jesus, son of David. He sees that. He recognizes it. In fact, he shouts it, son of David, have mercy on me. It's very undignified and a very beautiful testimony. It works. Jesus stops and stands still and calls the man over to him. He asks Bartimaeus, what what does mercy look like? What would you like from me? And Bartimaeus asks to see again. Jesus tells him that his faith has made him well and that he may go, but instead of leaving to go rejoin the groups and the work and the people that he would like to, he stays and he follows Jesus. Now, a couple fascinating things about this story and where it shows up in the gospel. First, this is the story that happens right before Jesus goes into Jerusalem for the last time. The story immediately following this one in Mark's gospel is Palm Sunday. The story of Jesus going into Jerusalem on the donkey and people shouting Hosanna and laying down their cloaks and palm branches. It's almost as if Bartimaeus screaming, Son of God, have mercy, sets the tone for that whole triumphant entry. What a beautiful thing. That's what comes right after this story, but right before this story is another interesting exchange that we've talked about recently, the story of the rich young ruler. Pastor Garrett preached on this story a couple of weeks ago, and if you remember, it's the story of this young, powerful man who comes to Jesus and asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, the rich young ruler is nothing but polite. It says that he approaches Jesus, he gets down on his knees and sort of bows to him and kindly asks, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus tells him, you have to give up all that you have and come and follow me. And the rich young ruler walks away devastated because He cannot do that. He's polite, and yet it doesn't take him where he needs to go. 
So we read that story in the beginning of Mark's gospel, and then here we have this Bartimaeus who is shouting and screaming. When Jesus finally calls Bartimaeus to him, the text says that he throws his cloak off and runs to Jesus. Now, this cloak would have been a very important part of the life of Bartimaeus. Likely he would have have it spread out beneath him. That is how he would collect his offerings of food and of money. The cloak would have been his protection against the elements, his livelihood, and yet at the prospect of following Jesus, he casts it off and runs to follow. So we have the story of this polite, rich, young ruler who cannot let go of his things. And then this almost abrasive, shouting Bartimaeus who throws it all off in order to follow. Sometimes the polite thing is not the Christian thing. Perhaps politeness and Christianity aren't as synonyms as we'd like to think. Perhaps the true way of discipleship and radical healing sometimes includes a raised voice. I wonder where we feel that tension in ourselves and as a church as well to do the thing that is polite or nice rather than the thing that raises a voice when necessary. There are fantastic examples in all of Christian history, but even in recent Christian history, that show us those important times when raising voices and not being polite matters. Just two weeks ago, two weeks ago today, Sister Megan Rice died. She was 91, she was a Catholic nun, who you may have heard of, she was very passionate about anti-war and uh, living for a life of peace. So early in her um, life, uh, Sister Megan heard the Isaiah scripture about beating swords into plowshares, and she decided to make it her mission and her ministry to promote peace. And she noticed that when she was speaking to government agencies and speaking about the biggest threats to peace, like nuclear warfare, it felt like she was just talking to a brick wall. And so she would do some pretty dramatic things to try to raise her voice on this important issue. And once she and two others actually broke into a government facility, a uranium facility, in order to shout her message of peace. She said that she was doing so because she could not imagine a life with nuclear war. She wanted to disrupt manufacturing that can only cause death. She ended up serving two years in federal prison for breaking into this facility while she was in her 80s, by the way. I can't even imagine. But she knew when the time was to be quiet and when the time was to shout. And that was part of her faith in Christ. We hear the need for this so clearly in Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from the Birmingham jail. He speaks so critically and rightly about the white moderate, saying the white moderate is more devoted to order than to justice. The white moderate prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. And it's not just the individual, but it's the collection, it's the church as well, the church as a whole. He goes on to say the contemporary church is often the arch supporter of the status quo. Far from being disturbed by the presence of the church, the power structure of the average community is consoled by the church's silent and often vocal sanction of things as they are. It seems that even churches sometimes catch the need to be nice and polite. But Martin Luther King Jr. knew that the Christian way was often not the way of polite 
niceness, but of disruption and challenge. St. Oscar Romero says something similar. The Salvadoran archbishop who spoke out against the government in El Salvador and the guerrilla groups who were fighting in the Civil War, he says, a church that does not provoke crisis, a gospel that does not disturb, a word of God that does not touch the concrete sin of the society in which it's being proclaimed, what kind of gospel is that? Almost exactly a year ago, this church, Fort Street Presbyterian, decided to become a Matthew 25 congregation. That means that along with hundreds of other churches in our denomination, we have said we are going to take the inspiration from that chapter of scripture from Matthew 25 to work on three ridiculously large and audacious goals. First, to build congregational vitality, second, to dismantle structural racism, and third, to eradicate systemic poverty. The good and the bad news is that there is no way we'll be able to even make a dent in any of these three things if our primary concern is being polite or being nice. We're not going to do anything with those goals if we're worried about upsetting the status quo if we care more about order than we do justice. What we learn is that what we think is peace is often not peace as all, at all. It's a status quo that is rich with power structures and injustice and societal pressure. So where are we as a church? I pray that we might not confuse niceness with holiness, that we might know that sometimes faith and the way of radical healing isn't polite, that sometimes being good isn't being quiet. I pray that the people of Detroit might see us in places and think, "Uh uh-oh, Fort Street's here. I wonder what's going to happen next. How might you raise your voice this week? Would you pray with me? Holy God, you are a God of whispers and of shouts. I pray that you would disrupt us enough to be a disruption of the status quo where your kingdom is at stake. Lord, help us follow your spirit as she whispers in our ear and shows us where to shout. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen.